last episode, we put together this fixed frequency sawtooth oscillator. But unless you're into super high pitched drone music, this is not really usable just yet. So in this video, we'll talk about how to change the oscillator's frequency. Before we start with that, there's a small adjustment we have to make though. While constructing the voltage divider last time, I messed up with the resistor values. Look at the waveform I picked up from after that voltage divider. The top part is weirdly rounded. This is not ideal because we don't want to put out a misshapen wave. To fix it, we'll just use two 10k resistors instead of 100k's for our divider. I'm not going to go into detail on why that works, because that's a topic for another video. Small hint though, we accidentally created a weird bandpass filter. Okay, let's check on our wave now. Great, it's looking pointy and sharp again. Okay, so now let's talk about oscillation frequency. Remember when I said that a sawtooth wave's pitch is easy to manipulate? Because it's all dependent on the wave's second phase? That's going to come in handy now, since that second phase is really just this capacitor discharging through this resistor. If it's discharging fast, the pitch is high. If it's discharging slow, the pitch is low. The speed of that discharging process is determined by exactly two factors. The capacitor's size and the resistor's resistance value. The bigger the balloon, the more water it can store, and the longer it takes to release the water. The tighter this pipe, the more it restricts the water flow. Let's try this out by first swapping the 2.2 nanofarad capacitor for a 1 microfarad one. That's about 450 times bigger. And as you can hear, the frequency is also a lot lower almost in the LFO range. Next I'll swap the old capacitor back in and then switch our 100k ohm drain resistor for a 1 mega ohm one. That's 10 times bigger. And so the pitch isn't lowered as much as before. So which route do we take? Changing the capacitance or changing the resistance? To be honest, that's pretty much a non-choice for two reasons. Reason one is that increasing the capacitance not only changes the second phase, but also the first phase of a wave along with it. If the capacitor is big enough, charging it will take more and more time, until our wave morphs into a weird triangular shape. Uh, let's check it out by installing a really big capacitor. And as you can see, the charging process now takes so long that the first phase gets seriously bent this way. This not only changes the sound, but also messes with the pitch. But apart from that, and more importantly, changing the capacitor can only be done manually by taking the old one out and installing a new one. And that's probably not the most fun way to make music. Which leaves us with only one true option, changing the resistance value. Here we thankfully have way more options than just changing it by hand. We could use a light dependent resistor, where the resistance value depends on the amount of light that shines onto it. We could also use a thermistor, which is the same idea but reacting to temperature instead. But the classic idea would be to use a transistor, which in this scenario works like a voltage controlled resistor. Before we get into that, let's take a look at what a transistor is exactly. There's a lot of different types of transistors, but the one we're looking at here is called the NPN bipolar junction transistor, which is quite the mouthful, which in turn is why most people just call them NPN transistors. Compared to all the components we discussed last time, these are definitely more complex. And our water analogy might get pushed a bit beyond its limits here. But let's try to apply it nonetheless. So imagine we have a T-shaped joint where two pipes meet, looking like this. There's three openings. This one we call the collector. This one is the base. And this one down here is called the emitter. 
Right in the middle, we have this seal blocking any water flow from here to here. That seal can move neither up nor down, but it can move horizontally, though there is a spring mechanism holding it in place. So pushing it in this direction requires some amount of force. With that in mind, let's check out two possible scenarios. First, imagine that there's a pump pushing water downwards from up here, while we are keeping the pressure levels neutral here and here. Since our seal is blocking any water from flowing in this direction, we will only be raising the pressure at this point. Not very exciting. But once we add in a second water pump pushing from this side, things get a lot more interesting. Because if that pump is strong enough, we will be able to overpower the spring and push the seal to the right, opening this junction and allowing water to pass through. So in effect, this downward flow is controlled by this kind of angular flow. As long as there's a pressure coming from here, the transistor will be open. And as soon as that pressure disappears, the spring will push our seal to the left, closing the transistor. Because of that, transistors like these are often used as electrical switches. Imagine a simple switch like this one, but instead of operating it by hand, we can operate it with a current. Very useful, definitely, but not exactly what we're looking for here. Instead of a choice between open and closed, we want to open the transistor to varying degrees, using a voltage, so that we're able to control our oscillator's pitch with it. And thankfully that's totally possible, if a bit tricky. You might assume that the relationship between the pressure applied from here and the openness of the transistor is always simple and linear so that any small increase in voltage here results in a proportional small reduction in resistance for the path from here to here. But that's totally not how a real-life transistor behaves. Instead, there's different operation regions, depending on the amount of pressure applied to the base. So typically, you would use a transistor in what's called the linear region of operation, which it enters if there's at least 0.7 volts applied to the base. Then the transistor will work like a current amplifier, meaning that the amount of water flowing into the base and out of the emitter will linearly determine how much water can flow from collector to emitter. Since the amplification factor of a transistor typically ranges from around 100 to 900, any small increase in water flow into the base will make the transistor open up by a lot until it's completely open and reaches the saturation region. Think of it like this. If we push hard enough from here, we will be able to overpower the spring, making our seal move enough to the right so that the flow from up here will help keep the seal open because of displacement. And once we've reached this state, our spring's pushing force is practically neutralized. Now, any additional water flowing into the base can pass through unobstructed, while still causing the seal to move to the right a lot. Granted, this is where our analogy needs some suspension of disbelief, but I guess we can just chalk it up to the strange interactions between this flow, this flow, and the spring. So can we use this linear region to control our oscillator's pitch? Technically, yes, but there's three reasons why that's not an ideal solution. First of all, when a transistor is in that linear region, it's already really open. We can't really measure that in ohms to compare it to a resistor, but just take it from me that it's a lot more open than the 100k ohm resistor we used previously. And with that resistor, our oscillator's pitch was already way too high. So we would need to use a way bigger capacitor, and I've already explained why that is not a good idea. Second, a transistor in its linear region is controlled by the amount of current flowing into the base. So it's all about how much water is passing through. That is not what we're looking for. We want to be able to control the pitch using a voltage. So our transistor's openness should be determined by the amount of pressure at the base. Third, and this is a big one, we actually don't want our transistor to operate in a linear fashion. 
This has to do with the relation between musical notes and their assigned frequencies. If we start out with the lowest C, this note corresponds to a frequency of 16.35 Hz. Going up one octave means that for the next C, our frequency is doubled at around 32 Hz. One more octave and the frequency doubles again. And that means that the relationship between notes and frequencies is an exponential one. Since we are trying to make our VCO conform to the volt per octave standard, we want to match voltages and frequencies like this. Whenever the voltage increases by one, our oscillator's pitch should go up one octave. To achieve this, the relationship between voltage input and frequency output also needs to be exponential, because we are basically mapping voltages to notes. And because our oscillator's pitch is determined by how open our transistor is, we would need that transistor to open up exponentially as the voltage at its base increases linearly. Sounds difficult. How do we do that? Well, thankfully, it's extremely easy. Remember how I said that the transistor enters its linear region if there's at least 0.7 volts applied to the base? Turns out that if we stay below that amount of pressure, we are now in a strange not really on, not really off state, where the transistor behaves completely different. Here, all three of our problems completely disappear, because first, the transistor is barely open, so the resistance between collector and emitter is really big. Second, instead of the base current controlling the transistor, now everything depends on the base voltage. And third, the relation between base voltage and the openness of the transistor is actually exponential. Quite convenient. If we want to make sense of this with our water analogy, we are probably going to have a pretty hard time. But let's try nonetheless. So we'll assume there's only a really low amount of pressure applied to the base. This might be enough to slightly move the seal to the right, but the pathway that's opening is so small that only a tiny amount of water from the base and the collector can pass through. Most of the water is still blocked from flowing, and that's why the displacement effect we talked about earlier is not really happening yet. So the spring is basically still in control, pushing hard to close the seal. But with every bit of an increase in pressure at the base, the spring loses that control to the displacement effect. The more water is passing through from collector to emitter, the weaker the spring gets, basically. And coincidentally, that spring weakness is increasing exponentially if the base pressure increases linearly. Strange stuff. Okay, enough theory. Let's see if all of that even works in real life. So we will replace our drain resistor with this BC548, which is just a standard general purpose NPN transistor. This leg is the collector, this one's the base, and over here is the emitter. We will have to connect the collector to the junction of capacitor, diode and Schmidt trigger sensor, while the emitter needs to lead directly to ground. Next, we will have to find a way to apply a voltage to the base to open the transistor. While we could just build multiple different voltage dividers for that, there is a way more comfortable solution. Using a potentiometer. These things can be used as variable resistors that you control using this knob. But, and that's the handy part, they can also be set up as variable voltage dividers. To see how that works, let's imagine we open one up. Inside, we would find two things. A round track of resistive material with connectors on each side, plus what's called a wiper. This wiper makes contact with the track and also has a connector. It can be moved to any position on the resistive track. Now, the resistance value between the two track connectors is always going to stay exactly the same. And that's why it's used to identify a potentiometer as a 10k, 20k, 100k. But if you look at the resistance between any of those connectors and the wiper connector, 
you'll find that that's completely dependent on the wiper's position. The logic is really simple. The closer the wiper is to a track connector, the lower the resistance is going to be between the two. So if the wiper is dead in the middle, you'll have 50% of the total resistance between each track connector and the wiper. From here, you can move it in either direction and by that shift the ratio to be whatever you want it to be. By now, you might be able to see how that relates to our voltage divider. You can think of it this way. This point, which we called our output, matches up with the wiper. While the two resistors match up with these two pieces of the resistive track. Remember how we said that the relation between the two resistors determines the voltage level at the output? This means that by turning the potentiometer's knob, we can adjust the voltage level at the wiper from zero to the input voltage. For that to work, we'll simply have to set it up like this. This connector is our input, this one's our output, and this one goes straight to ground. Okay, let's see how this works in practice. I'll use this 100k ohm potentiometer, though the size doesn't really matter for our purposes, since we only care about voltage here, not current. For the input, I'll just use the 12 volts from our power rail. And before we connect the wiper to our transistor, let's first connect it to a multimeter, so that we can verify everything's working as expected. As you can see, we are now able to produce any voltage between 0 and 12 volts. So I'd say we're good to connect this to our transistor now. One caveat though. To prevent creating a short circuit, I'll put a 100k ohm resistor between our potentiometer and the transistor. This way only a small amount of current can flow, while the voltage at the base is unaffected. If we don't do this, we might see some smoke when we completely open the voltage divider and push everything my power supply has through our transistor. And that's not the most pleasant experience. As you can hear, our oscillator is completely dead in the upper voltage range. That's because the transistor is way too open there. But as soon as I get down to about 550 millivolts, it suddenly starts oscillating. The knob is really finicky, but you can go from really high pitched down to just periodic clicks. And the range for that is between approximately 350 and 550 millivolts. This is exactly the transistor's not really on, not really off region I talked about earlier. So far, so good. But if the usable voltage range for the transistor is only between 350 and 550 millivolts, aren't we going to run into trouble if we connect our sequencer? We said that we want our VCO to conform to the voltproactive standard. That means that starting with 0 volts, every volt should span exactly one octave. Look at this sequence I drew up as an example. It uses the full 5 volt range my SQ1 is able to put out, while the lowest node should be a low C at 0 volts. To contrast this, I've marked our transistor's usable voltage range. As you can see, our sequence is near completely outside of those bounds. There's two major problems. First, our sequence is just too big. And second, it's centered way too low. Because our transistor is completely shut off at zero volts. To fix these problems, we'll first deal with the sequence's size or voltage range. Maybe you can guess what the solution here is, because we've talked about it a lot already. Since all we're really trying to do is scale a set of voltages down, another simple voltage divider should do the trick. My SQ1 has a maximum range of 5 volts, and our transistor's usable region spans about 200 millivolts. So our input voltage is 25 times bigger, which means that if we choose R1 to be 100k ohms big, R2 should be about 4k ohms. This way, we size the input down by a factor of 25. 
uh, for the record. I'm just roughing it here. We will have to fine tune these values another time. Okay, so our sequence is tiny enough now, but it's still not centered correctly. So we need to shift its center upwards quite a bit. For that, we can do the reverse of something we did in the last video. Remember what an offset voltage is? It's basically a constant voltage that a changing voltage is riding on top of. This is exactly what we need here. So instead of removing it like last time, we will be adding it to our sequence. Adding two voltages is thankfully really simple if you do it with a passive mixing circuit, which is just two resistors set up like this. Here are the two inputs, while over here we have the mixed output. From here on out, it's just about assembling ideas we already discussed. For the offset voltage, we will be reusing the variable voltage divider concept using the potentiometer. This way, we're able to change our offset voltage on the fly. And then we will scale our mixes output down by adding the 4K ohm resistor to ground. This basically creates a voltage divider with two inputs, which works just like a regular one input one, just for two combined input voltages. So with our potentiometer, we should now be able to move our sequence up so that it fits within our transistor's usable voltage range. Now that I've set all of that up, let's see if it actually works. Right now, the potentiometer is completely closed, so there's no offset voltage added to my sequence. And as you can hear, not much is happening besides some weird clicking noises. But as I open the potentiometer, the sequence seems to be sliding into focus. And at this point, all the notes are properly pronounced. Great stuff. Even though it doesn't sound all that harmonious. Plus, there is another problem. If I touch the transistor, you can hear how dramatically the sequence starts drifting. This is because the transistor's openness is heavily dependent on temperature. So in the next episode, we will tackle these two problems. First, we will get rid of the temperature dependence so that the tuning is nice and reliable. And then we will learn how to fine tune our scaling circuit so that our VCO actually conforms to the Volt Proactive standard and we won't have to bear this CATS concert anymore. See you then.